I'm Fathery. This is Dave. And this is Text Trek. Engage. So welcome back aboard the Starship Texas for the 86th installment of the Tex Trek podcast, your home for Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we talk all about Star Trek, old and new. And tonight will probably be a very short podcast because we're talking about the shortest episode of Star Trek ever. (laughs) The shortest of the short treks. Yes. (laughs) Uh, our, Our most recent short trek, Ask Not. Written by Kalinda Vasquez and directed by Sanji Sanaka. Are these people who are, are, are doing other big things right now for Trek? Um, as far as I could tell, this is their first contributions to the franchise. Okay. Uh, well, like I want to just quick say good on them because of the tra- short track season two, I think this is my favorite. Me I, too. I was not like in love with it. But it was my favorite of them, and it certainly did not actively offend me, like the triple outing. (laughs) Yeah, um, I didn't have as big of a problem with the trouble with Edward, Mm -hmm. uh, as we discussed in our previous uh, podcast, as you did, Dave. But I'll bring um, you around. There, well, there were things in there that I didn't like about it. Um, I thought both of the the uh, existing short treks for season two, we had a Q and A. And the trouble with Edward, and I thought they they were both just kind of meh, right? Um, they they both had like I guess some good things in there, but overall I wasn't very satisfied, right? Um, however, like with this episode, I feel like it is so brief and so short and doesn't really do much that I don't get a ton of satisfaction out of it. But what it does in this very brief, uh, like nine and a half minute story, mm-hmm. it it. Everything that it tries to do, it does extremely well. I really have to compliment Kalinda Vasquez for for writing this. Um, this is the the best written short trek in my opinion, just because uh, You're the, including season one in there too. Yeah, interesting. Um, just because of the way that, that that this feels like it could totally fit into um, like a TOS era TV show. It the way that she mentions. Little Easter eggs that are dropped in there. That, uh, you know, I'm a big continuity guy. I love when they can connect stuff and mm-hmm. use the established canon. Um, and you're just a bitch for anything with <laughs> with Tholians in it. Aren't I you? love the I love the Tholians, and I'm so glad that they got a name drop. Here. <laughs> they could have very easily like used the Klingons. Yep. Um, yeah. No, but, I thought that was cool too. Uh, yeah. You know, this was kind of tightly written and punchy. Um, I do think that I, like, if I poke at it a little bit in my brain, the same way I did with Q&A, and I was like, I don't know if I f- that feels very Starfleet-y to tell Spock to suppress what makes him unique if he wants to go on the command track. I'm like, that, that really that really ended up bugging me. Um, th- I've got, like, maybe one or two complaints about that for this episode, too. This episode, which was effectively Kobayashi Maru, the 10-minute uh, series. Because apparently, what we have learned well, is that Starfleet likes to play pranks mm-hmm. <laughs> on their on their uh, uh, cadets and try and destroy their mind. Uh, I, I have something to add to that, but yes. um, we'll just we'll just go ahead and now that we've established how we feel about this, we'll just go ahead and briefly summarize this very brief story. Okay, um, there, there's um, not really. Not really uh, too much to explain, but... It's mostly a kind of character interaction one, but yeah, you want to go ahead and spit out the plot? Sure. So, um, the story focuses on a Starfleet cadet, Sidhu. She is stationed at Starbase 28. Um, She receives a prisoner, a Starfleet officer who is mutinied, who turns out to be none other than Captain Christopher Pike. And she's like, oh my god, this is like the hero of Starfleet. 
Uh, everyone uh, loved him in season two of Discovery. How could this guy have mutinied? There is a. Con- <laughs> I don't remember her saying that exactly, but there, okay, I'm there, with you. There's a conflict with the Tholians. A uh, classic TOS baddie who have been incredibly underused, and I love whenever they're mentioned. And uh, he basically says, uh, let me go. I'll go fight these Tholians. I know you have history with them. Uh, he, he's, he says that, like, yeah, your husband was on a ship that was attacked by them, and I can go, like, save that ship, save the USS Bowman, and save your husband. But she refuses to defy orders. She doesn't release Pike. She says, no, you have to stay here. The Enterprise has to stay here, and we'll face the Tholians together here at Starbase 28. Those are my orders. Those are the regulations. We're doing this by the book, fool. And then Pike says, uh, oh, you just got punked. And there's basically like a hidden camera Lights show. up. The the Stranger Things kid like walks out, and um, whatever that prank show on Netflix is now. Um, <laughs> what? I can't remember what it's called, uh, but it, it's basically like, oh no, this is all a test, and you did so well, and you're a great cadet, and we would love to have you on board the Enterprise, and she gets to transfer over to the flagship of the fleet. Uh, I guess uh, if she had like let him go out of his manacles, they'd be like, you're fired. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Go back to Starfleet. Uh, go back to the Academy. Or, yeah, yeah, they probably would have sent her back to the Academy. Um, I, I can't remember if you said in there that like the whole time that the ship... Uh, is is uh, getting pounded by in this like it like it looks yeah. you know there's like explosions going off the, the station is under attack in a, a fake simulation that she thinks is real right and you know feels pretty real according to Star Trek tradition which is to say lots of things shaking lots of explosions of well, panels that opens with a giant explosion behind her head that like yeah. knocks her onto the floor clearly that was I mean that was really as much for we the audience to like get us. Uh, make us believe the scenario it was selling because we're like, oh, well, clearly that's real. This is also the uh, first time a short trek opened with kind of like a like a teaser before the title card. Uh, um, they've always opened with the title card first, except for this instance, which was weird because as I was watching it, my girlfriend asked, uh, we were watching it for the first time Thursday night. She said, what's the name of this one? And then right when she said that, the title card pops up and says, ask not. <laughs> <laughs> You're like pipe down. <laughs> uh, but, but I got I got a quick question. Okay, so th- I'm, I'm just gonna quick say my complaint up front because I like I like I enjoyed the ride on this episode and I and I liked really liked the interaction between her and Pike and 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 and, um, and Ensign Ensign Mount Ensign Mount's performance. But I uh, although I love the Kobayashi Maru idea, like I've always thought that was a neat idea. It was it was so cool in Star Trek Two how it was like worked as this, like, metaphor that, like, ran throughout the whole movie and everything. And, you know, I love that that had the backstory where Kirk was the one guy who'd beat it and added to his mythology. It, sure. It, it made everything kind of... It was really cool. And then they've, they've referenced it all over the place since. But I don't think I ever particularly got the impression that Starfleet like to punk people. Like, people... Cadets, it, they said it played they, havoc with them. They did, though. There's a, a, a precedent for Tell it. Tell me. In uh, season one of Next Generation, the episode Coming of Age, where Wesley Crusher is going to take his, like, entry exam to get mm-hmm. into the Academy, and they actually do, the, like, this... Nobody's this... seen season one of Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> A lot of people have seen it. Uh, but they're... they've all put it out of their mind. <laughs> but they, uh, they, they basically have him there competing with, like, some classmates, and we get to see, like, a Vulcan chick, and we get to see a uh, uh, Ben Zeit uh, with uh-huh. the... What is his name? Like um, uh, Burdock or Murdoch or something like that with like the breather thing. Yep. And um, they they create the situation where it's like, oh no, like we're going to do a test, but now it's like in danger. And Wesley, you have to like save this guy or like leave him behind and save yourself. And it was all like, uh, it was like this. It was like, like he, they legitimately like tricked him to think he was in like a life or death situation. Out of curiosity, was it the whole episode or big No, it was just like, it was just like a thing at the end. Okay. It's kind of like a nine-minute thing, just like it was here. I guess what I'd say is it doesn't quite seem to fit Starfleet to me. Uh, it's almost like the more that they do it, the less it seems right. Like well, I, like Kobayashi Maru, sure, people knew what they were getting into but there. People know that's a test, whereas this is different and coming of age is different. And it, it kind of bothers me, too, as something that would be like kind of cruel, but it, it does have like some dramatic value to it even though maybe in kind of a cheap way. However, because Pike says, I know this might have seemed a little inhumane, the fact that they kind of address it a little bit, right. it, it, it makes it easier to it swallow. It felt almost like a slightly, potentially slightly meta comment from him to 
to say, hey, yeah, this 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 might have seemed inhumane. Um, but he also mentioned uh, he specifically mentioned wartime, and because we can presume this was happening in the midst of the, uh, uh, do we think probably when the with the Klingon war going on? Well, this is I would assume this is after season two of Discovery, but with the war fresh in their mind, maybe. right? So that's probably been like a big. I was going to bring that up too. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. That's probably been like a big deal of like you probably have like all like post PTSD Starfleet personnel, yeah, that are like. We, and people could be very, like, they don't show this, but people could be very divided over how things happen in the war. I don't know if people you know know how close the uh, Klingon homeworld came to getting genocided uh, and all that. But Earth also came close to being genocided. Right. So it does kind of make sense. Um, at the same time, Trek has, like, kind of always seemed to somewhat value having its independent-minded, uh, not by the book stuff. You know, that is to say, in the movies at least, where they get more rebel they, they often uh, talk about the value of sort of their rebels. But uh, in the shows, they tend to be a little more by the book. So it does make sense there. And it makes a little bit more sense in wartime. Um, so when they, they open, they start things off by telling her that, that Pike had committed a mutiny, that he tried to save an admiral aboard the USS Bowman, who was ordering him not to come save her because their, their ship was... was it was like a trap for, yeah, it was, to the, capture the Enterprise. The, the Tholians were trying to draw the Enterprise out. Pike says that he defied those orders and went to rescue the Admiral anyway. So in uh, Cadet Sidhu's uh, head, this is kind of a question of either revenge or saving her boyfriend, or I'm sorry, husband, husband. Um, uh, versus uh, potentially getting the Enterprise captured by the Tholians. That's the duty side, yeah. right? Like, that is the real, the actual threat that was kind of presented to her. And they want to make sure she's going to save the Enterprise. Um, yes. that's pretty reasonable, ultimately. Uh, I, th- I think that's not, I, I can buy that as maybe something that needs to be tested. What about, like, with the twist of, like, oh, like, Pike actually didn't commit this mutiny? Did, did, could you tell from early on that Pike was acting kind of weird? Uh, yes. I, I think I did start to suspect something like a simulation early on. Uh, to be honest, when this episode ended... I kind of thought there was going to be a little bit more to it. I, you know, when they when they got to the bridge and we were having these sort of denouement with... Uh, they don't with, go to the bridge. Uh, oh, you're right, you're right. But when they're talking to number one and Spock... In the transporter room. In the transporter room. Uh, to me, I was like, oh, oh, this is like sort of the end of the episode. That's, that's actually going to be it. I thought that there was going to be a little bit more to the reveal. So in a way, it was almost a little prosaic. I, I feel like I've seen... Well, like, I do remember that, as you were talking about, the episode with uh, Wesley Crusher. Coming of age. Um, And I somewhat feel like I've seen this concept played out in various... I mean, honestly, I don't... I can't think of many before Star Trek II, but I know genre fiction likes the notion of stories wherein people are put into stuff they don't know is a test. And and I've seen... Or stuff that the audience doesn't know is a test. Right. It's kind of more exciting that way, and then there's that kind of weird relief or... You know, freak out moment, little M. Night Shyamalan moment when all is revealed. Um, uh, now, this was kind of neat because you got to recognize that he was trying to push particular buttons. And um, it was fun. Like, you, we were talking about this off mic. You pointed out that Anton Mountain did a particularly good job of portraying, what, what would you say, a traitorous <laughs> version of himself? Yeah, he, he's, he's playing a Pike who's playing a character. Uh, so he's acting like a little differently. Now the the idea that he would commit mutiny to rescue an admiral in a starship uh, that is something that I can see Pike doing, especially that they have established that yeah sometimes you got to be a little rebellious in Star Trek, and mm-hmm. they even do that a little bit with him in season two of Discovery. Sure, um, but he but, was kind of po- poking at her real aggressively. Yeah, it felt and, like he was trying to knock down her mental defenses, and, and, and in a way that did not seem like Pike. He he does not. He would have. He would come up with a rash, more reasonable, rational way right. to try and win her. Over. And it was making me think that maybe he was a shapeshifter, or it was a simulation, or something, mm-hmm. uh, or he was like some type of like imposter. Who had, uh, but, uh, the um, way that he plays Pike in some of these sequences, though, where he is like very intense, he almost seems like a little bit like Shatner Kirk from the original series, more yeah. so than normal. And I know that Anson Mountain has admitted to being like a huge fan of TOS growing up, and. Mm-hmm. And how he loves sitting in that captain's chair so much like a childhood dream. Actually, with because of, like, the dramatic, like, red alert lighting and the smoke from, like, the fires and damage and stuff like that, 
it's almost lit at times a little like a TOS episode, and he had a little bit of that dramatic lighting. So and it's just like coincidence. Yeah. But he you actually, always point out when they do that. You always <laughs> like uh, notice that. Well, it's it's. I, ex- I like it too, though. It's exciting to me. Uh, the little 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 bit of TOS melodrama. I need I need the melodramatic music too to go with it. Like yeah. Da 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 da. Yeah, I need some of that. Um, uh, what do you call it? Doomsday machine music. Um, that would have been good here, yeah, when the whole station is yeah. shaking. So, uh, you know, something else I wanted to point out, speaking of, like, the rising tension, is uh, the actress uh, who played Sidhu, uh, she... Amrit, Amrit K.R., I think is how you say her name, but I'm sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Okay. Uh, Amrit, uh, uh, she, um, uh, you know, when he first comes in, he just immediately sort of tries to, like, like a bull, uh, kind of, like, say, like, pull up the comm system. And she's kind of stammering, you know, she's like, um, yeah, I can't do that. You no. can't give orders. And, and she's real unsure of herself, as she, you would be. Yeah, like the captain of the flagship is now your prisoner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I liked is then watching over the course of the ten minutes or eight minutes of the, their time together, she she finds herself. She kind of finds that steel that she needs. And you can see her her personality really change. It's kind of hard to do in just eight minutes or so. Uh, so that by the end, she's got a phaser on him. She's like, you will not go through that door and all this. You know, she like, she finds her, her Starfleet resolve. Yeah. Hashtag we are Starfleet. <laughs> right. Um, so, so yeah, kudos to the actress for pulling off an arc within that very limited time. Yeah. Um, all, all this is good stuff. It just it is a little, I don't know. It's a little just, conventional? Um, I think it's a little conventional. It's like, we're, Getting what feels kind of almost like a fragment to what could be like a greater story or something. It, it, it's a, it's a, a good sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like how it like stands on its own, it's just like, it, it, it's not super ambitious. Yeah. At the same time, like I guess I don't know what what was the name of the episode that um, was in the first season where a uh, thousand years in the future a guy falls in love with oh, the Enterprise or Discovery. Uh, that was ambitious, but also. It wasn't a Star Trek story. Displeasing to me. <laughs> yeah, I like this more. Yeah. Um, this made me think of the... I, I think what some of the ones that with, with Number One and Spock and Pike have done, this made me want a Pike sh- uh, series. This made me want Enterprise Yes, we series. need that Pike show so bad that Alex Kurtzman has teased us about, that Anson Mount has teased us about. Yeah. That he says he would love to do. I saw him in Vegas say this to the crowd that he said... Look, uh, nothing I've ever done before in my career has gotten a, this kind of reaction, and I love it, and I would love to do more of it. I'm like, why haven't we greenlit this show yet? Come on, CBS All Access. They need to go ahead and do it. Um, and and they should have uh, this this actor, Sidhu, uh, or that, that cadet Sidhu should be in the show. Uh, I honestly also would have been happy with uh, a return from the uh, science officer who left to go be in that stupid Tribbles episode. I liked her, too. Basically, I like all the sort of ancillary characters that we've seen from the Enterprise. So, uh, you know, and, and every time I see number one and Spock, I like to see them as well. And I'm just going to segue off of what you're saying and talk about, like, how much I would love to see that show. How I love that we finally have, like, some color on Star Trek with, like, the sets and the colorful uniforms that aren't all blue like we had on Discovery. Yep. That they, they put more color in, in the sets. And uh, you see some, like blue and yellow pipes, kind of like the TOS color palette. There's a lot of, like, there's a lot of red, there's a lot of, um, uh, color on, on the ships and the corridors, on the Starbase. I really would love a TOS era show that had this look, except for the two big things I didn't like in the short track that would kind of bother me about a Pike show if they continued to do this type of stuff. One is that stupid mask that they put over <laughs> Anson Mount's head to like hide his identity and then do like this dramatic reveal and it's a completely unnecessary CGI special effect to where like the mask like unfolds like um I don't even know what what would you describe that as? Uh, um it was almost like, as if it was like it wasn't quite nanotechnology, but it was something like nanotechnology. Oh, it's like Pl- uh, platelets. It's like that gravity emitter that they had in the first episode of season that two of Discovery. That from yeah. almost nothing. Um, I, yeah, like, I hate that. Uh, yeah. And that was so weird and felt so out of place with 
Star like, Trek, especially it's like unnecess- TOS era. It's like unnecessarily tech wank, yeah. kind of. And then at the end... Or special effects wank, I should say. At the end, when they showed the engineering set, and how it looked ridiculously large to be on that ship, it looked nothing like the engineering set we had in the original series, and we have those stupid uh, R2-D2 repair robots. I mean, at this point, I feel like they're, they're Wally robots, or Eva actually uh more than anything they look like eva uh from wally um by the way his gimp mask that he wore or executioner's <laughs> hood if you yeah. want to be a little bit like cooler about it um uh, didn't particularly bother me it was obviously there so that they could have a dramatic reveal uh, i think it sort of worked for the test they were giving so that the officers could say they could start out with, hey, we need you to hold this prisoner while the ship is in danger. We can't get to the brig. So just ne- you need to watch him. And I was like, okay, you, you can understand how somebody would be like, well, that make, I can do that. Uh, and then they have to dramatically reveal it to the captain. So you see, oh man, the stakes are going to go through the roof on this one. Uh, I think that's an okay bit of drama. I can see reasons why you well, might want to have... like a black sack on his head that you pull off. No, it's not Abu Ghraib, dude. <laughs> they, this is a, this is like something that they could use, like, if a creature, like, if it was like an alien that had some kind of, that would spit acid or uh, shoot lasers from its eyes or hypnotize you or, or who knows what crazy alien things that aliens can do in Star Trek. They, um, I could see its existence. It, it could be handy. I can't picture, like, Kirk and Spock uh, on TOS having something like that. It just seems dumb. Uh, let's see. Are, are there any, are there any races in Star Trek that can spit venom? Um, that, somebody... that guy that, uh, Trip was stranded with in what was actually, like, one of my least favorite episodes of Star Trek ever in season two of Enterprise. Yeah. Um. All right. What about him? But... What if you had to have him prisoner? Do you want that guy spitting acid? Then I don't need this, like, weird technology that, like, unfolds, you know, this little handheld device. Like, how how often are you putting masks on people that you need, like, this pocket device that you can whip out and and retract the, the mask back into? It just seems really gonna weird. You're going to make me make a stand for the GIMP mask, all right? Yeah. So I'm going to do it. Just, just agree with me that it was dumb. No, no, it was okay. It was dramatically good for the sequence. It gave you a, a little, uh, like, the tension went from, like, uh-oh, you know, like... Your cadet being asked to do a little bit more than normal to, oh my god, and like that's a kind of a good build up. If it had just been Pike right out of the gate, or she, even if they had kept him hidden, you would have seen the reaction on her face, and you would have known it was somebody huge. So, so you needed like a, like a, like a few things to get to that place. I think it dramatically works, and absolutely, I can like if you're gonna have holding cells at all, if you're going to occasionally have to capture somebody. You should probably have things that can accommodate different alien species and whatever their defenses might be. Whether it's like the tusks of a, uh, of, of a pigman. Help me out. Tellerite. Tellerite, thank you. Uh, or, or, um, or, or whatever. Uh, but I think it's okay. They didn't, uh, this actually technology, this, this looks, this was better to me than the transporter or the, the transforming thing from the, from season one. Because I can see that it could be useful. Okay. Well, I hate it. All right. And what? how do you feel about the engineering set at the end? If they do make an Enterprise show, you know they're going to use that, right? Like, they didn't build it for nothing. No, they could... They could. Uh, I mean, that was just like some dumb CGI shot that we see one time. Like, I don't they, know. They could it build something like, practical that looks a little better. It looked like some better. work went into it. There were, like, multi-planar qualities to it and robots in the background like george lucas had gone in and said it needs more cute shit no i think if i think if they did a pike show set on the enterprise they would build a practical engineering set uh i hope so but i would i wouldn't be surprised if it's made to look larger like that like they're like let's make the enterprise section or the engineering section really shine that makes me actually really appreciate the uh spore room we had in Discovery actually does kind of look like the TOS engine room where you have like that that window in the back that has point. like the 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 warp reactor yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, other than those th- two nitpicks which kind of makes me appreciate the script more. I, I was I was giving the script a lot of kudos earlier mm-hmm. um because like those are things that like the writer didn't really have like any right. impact she on. She probably, probably didn't say like it's a really deep canyony engine room yeah. in the script pages. Uh she probably said uh it scenes from engine room behind him and that was it and then their set designers went to town. Um 
Uh, did you have anything else? Uh, let me think. Uh, did um, uh, anything? Did we learn anything from new from Spock and Number One in there? Oh, there was a little banter between them, a little yeah. playful banter. Uh, it like really that. makes me want to see a show between this this uh, new this new trinity of Pike and Spock and Number One. Oh, that would be so weird that you have like two like kind of like cold, logical, calculating uh, people on the ship with Pike. Well, except you, that except that Number One in execution is rather different than she was depicted in the cage uh, back when. She is not. She is definitely more energetic and outgoing. And not the kind of because cold. she was singing in the a couple short trucks ago in the turbo lift. Uh, yeah, well that too, and like she just seems vibrant, eating her eating her spicy foods, and uh, uh, she she's got a kind of energy to her the way uh, Rebecca Romaine plays her. I don't know. I I feel like they're 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 close enough to like the same vibe. But... I mean, she's kind of, but she is she's brainy though. Like for sure, she's 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 an intellect, yeah. and uh, she's just not like. I don't think she's particularly cold about it. I think you, Spock you would, have, would still get to hold that role. You would you would have Pike with like the two eggheads that I uh I, I think you would need like a more you would need someone to be like a little bit more like the, the Doctor McCoy or even just like the Tilly of that show. Just like have like some Well interject some like emotion and humanity and heart into it. Is is the Doctor from the Cage still the Doctor? Um we don't know. Cause like I wouldn't mind seeing him recast. Although that may be too close to Doctor McCoy, he was a yeah. he was an old country doctor. Yeah, that was um, either Doctor Boyce or Piper. I, I can't remember. But um, you know that you know they make it more of an ensemble than just three. So yeah, and, so, and I would like to see some new characters too. Yeah, I, I'd be down for it, and I would hope that uh, honestly they, they've they've given her enough time to make her make a point of her. So I would hope that uh, Cadet Sidhu does make it in as as a supporting character somewhere in there, even if she's if, not like a regular. Um, I'm not sure if they would do that, but I, I would definitely like to see her again. And um, do you think? Do uh, you think like uh, Pike and the security guard? Do you think they like kind of like hamming it up? You know, doing these kind of things. <laughs> Is it like the fifth one he's done that day? And he's like, I think I got really nailed a performance that time. I think I kind of flubbed my lines on um, the first one. I think that he. Kind of just sees it as a duty, and he doesn't. He's such like a uh, compassionate guy. I think he doesn't really like torturing these people like that. But um, I don't know. He, he seemed all kind of wink and smile at the end. He didn't. Yeah, seem... but he was also like, yeah, I'm sorry, that felt a little inhumane. Right. He did say, "We're bringing your boyfriend over for for a conjugal visit. H- husband." Yeah. Uh, right. All right. Whatever. She seems so young. I, she's too young to get married. She's a cadet. She's still in the academy. Yeah. She, wait till your thirties. <laughs> but um. I think we're just going to go ahead and move into the the Easter eggs. There right. were a few to pick up in this very brief nine and a half minute story. What do we got? Um, there were some Starfleet regulations thrown around in dialogue here. Uh, one of them, Regulation 191, in a combat situation involving more than one ship, command falls to the vessel that has the tactical superiority. And uh, that was something that was established in the... Star Trek Voyager episode, uh, season five, episode 26. It was the season finale, Equinox, mm-hmm. part one. Um, there is, uh, another, uh, regulation mentioned in this up. Ep- er, do you think, do you think that's a sensible regulation? It makes some sense to uh, me. Yeah. Um, I'm not a military tactician, but I, <laughs> si- on a simple level, it seems to make sense. And just from like, uh, a Star Trek perspective, I really like when they use the cannon. I mean, yeah. It was like an appropriate opportunity to do so. Sure. Um, and in the age of like memory alpha being online where like any writer can look any of this stuff up, it's like, why wouldn't you just take the time to do that? Yeah. Uh, it's Those not... writers are like, I will not be bounded by Star Trek Wikipedia. Yeah, then don't write Star Trek. Go write your own thing. Tell them. Um, there's another regulation, uh, Directive uh, 010, before engaging an alien species in battle, you must make any attempt to... Achieve non-military resolutions. Uh, Any and all uh, attempts. That, that was also mentioned in Voyager in the episode In the Flesh, although I don't remember the season and if, episode number for that one. If I was getting court-martialed over failing to do this, I think that I would want my lawyer to really press on the ambiguity of any and all. Because any and all implies such a wide, vast tapestry <laughs> of possibilities that I don't think that anyone could ever be said to have tried any and all 
uh, attempts uh, at peaceful resolution or first contact. Anyway, I'm warming up my legal argument for when it ine- inevitably happens to me. Yeah, that's the uh, the Cogsworth, Cogsley. What was it? The, <laughs> yes. the attorney from the court martial? Uh, That'd be his approach. God, is it? Yes, it's Samuel T. Cogley. That's that's it. Okay, there yeah. we go. Good guy. That's a guy. That guy's a cool character actor too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did a good job. I love him. Um, oh. and um, but uh, I was joking a little bit, but I do actually. Uh, that's a super Starfleet kind of optimistic, pacifistic thing that I like. The notion that they essentially, uh, even if uh, maybe I feel like I could legally punch some holes in it, uh, <laughs> that, that they prize above all else a peaceful solution uh, with an unknown alien species over, over that, combat. That classic Roddenberry ethos. Absolutely. That goes all the way back to like TOS season one and like stories like Arena. Yeah. And um, other other times, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the carbolite maneuver. Yeah, Kirk was always about trying to figure out his uh, opponents. He did not just want to defeat them. And uh, there is also mention of the reserve activation clause, which uh, of course was used in the motion picture to draft Doctor McCoy back into action for the V'ger crisis. Nothing worse than being drafted when you got your full uh, 70s beard and, 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 and like... medallion and, and V-cut shirt. Yeah, yeah, when you're showing off some hairy chest. And like You know, like, he was at, like, the disco about to sniff a line of coke right when they beamed him up. Yeah. And that's why he was so cranky. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but, yeah, that was all the Easter eggs that I was able to pick up. If you spotted any that I did not, be sure to let me know that I'm an unobservant idiot and uh, tell me what you found. Rock on. Um, we did have some feedback on uh, this episode of Short Treks. Um, Dave, what, what did uh, people have to say about this on Twitter? All right, let me give you a few of these. Uh, Trek on the Tube says, predictable but fun. My favorite of the second lot so far. I think we probably roughly agree oh. with that. Right on, Sean. I'm with you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Boat Trek says... It's our friend PJ. Hey, PJ. Uh, it was a pretty intense simulation. That explosion could have killed her. Fortunately, it just gave her a head injury. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, Starfleet doesn't cheap out uh, on their simulations. Well, their medical technology is so good. Yeah. They're like, we can hurt her pretty bad and bring her back. It's yeah. okay. Um, She's, she signed the, the, do- the document giving us permission to do this when she enlisted. Uh, let's see. Four of seven writes... Uh, awesome handle, by the way. <laughs> if I ever wrote a Star Trek story that had a Borg, uh, that Borg would be named Four of Seven. It, t- it took me a second. To, yeah, my God. Uh, <laughs> four of Seven writes, Well, I've heard of Kirk or Spock being renegades in Starfleet, but I didn't expect Pike to be one. And then he revealed it was a simulation, and I was like, Ah, should have seen that coming. Um, they said, laugh out loud. Terrific. Uh, uh, Short Treks episode. Can't wait for the next one. Star Trek Picard and more. Thad writes, I enjoyed it better than The Trouble with Edward. It was a decent little episode. I did figure it out almost immediately, though. That's a little bit of a danger in something like this. And, you know, I think both of us were somewhat on our guard. We're like, eh, Pike doesn't... If at the very least, Pike didn't quite seem like Pike. Um, But sometimes you can still enjoy watching the beats play out and uh, and see what's up. So... Yeah, Thad hated The Trouble with Edward uh, almost as much as I think you did, Dave. Uh, good. <laughs> That's good. I, uh, I appreciate yeah, yeah, that so, level of So hatred. you're not alone. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, Rewind, a Star Trek podcast, says, A great glimpse into the playful seriousness Pike puts into his role as captain. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to put it. Um, and he did have a certain playfulness about it. Even though this, he did get, he got a little more grave at the end when he's like, Sorry about making you think your boyfriend was husband was about to die and all of that but there was a little he's got a little twinkle in his eye kind of some of those times i think Mm. he did have a little bit of fun doing it to be honest if i were to psychoanalyze it um and 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 take it a little probably more seriously than i should i would say that pike uh who reigns himself in sometimes uh, a fair amount uh, does actually get a little bit of a, a kick out of these maybe he, cutting loose. Maybe he's having a good time, like like whipping the new fish into into shape and like giving them a hard time. I think that there's something to it. A uh, like a, a little bit of the tough but loving drill sergeant. Certainly, that's not who he is most of the time. 
but there's a little bit of it in he's, him. It, part of the like gleefulness probably comes from him like being proud like she did the right thing that she passed the test. Yeah. It's like, you're, you're Enterprise material. You're coming back to the ship with me. Right. And I think that might make him push a little bit harder uh, to, to like, uh, uh, you throw himself into his role a little bit more. So that's a good point. And then on uh, Facebook, uh, Adam B. Owen, a friend of the podcast, says, It was okay. It actually seemed like a cold open to a full-on episode. Adam, I agree completely. This feels like it could have been the beginning of a uh, of a larger story. So why not just go ahead and make it one? Just tag it uh, in episode three of uh, no. short, uh, of the of the new. Uh, what are they going to call it? What would they call Pike's show? I don't know because Star Trek Enterprise is taken. Yeah, so. you're right. Uh, what about something like? Have they have they ever called just something like to to boldly go or something like that? Maybe. Um, Star Trek boldly go. Uh, maybe. I guess um, it was that was one of the comics that they did. Uh, for, that were based on the yeah. uh, 2009 Kelvin verse movie. Just uh, just use this as like the the cold open before your opening credits, and just have her come on board the ship and use her as your point of point of view character. A tried and true method that I often like. I I, I would be down with it. Yeah, it's like every X Men story ever tends to begin with like a uh, a new person joining the X Men. Yeah, sometimes what sometimes when it works, it works. You can throw some wrinkles into that so that it like. You know, one thing you could do is, uh, like, have the uh, point of view hand off as she, like, meets number one and then the camera stays with number one. And then you see number one go on down and it's at all one shot or at least made to look like when she goes down to the medical bay uh, or sick bay. And, you know, she's talking to the doctor and then the camera's with the doctor. I think that'd be kind of cool. So then you and throw do it, it all in one take. Yeah, but then it's all, it's all like one continuous shot through the entire shot. You know what? They can absolutely. That's easy to do now. Uh, Hitchcock's rope did it, yeah. and what they did was like I think it was like six or eight takes or something like that. They were long takes, and they had to hide it. But now with digital technology, you can perfectly hide it. Um, so yeah, do it. Do it. I say do it for real and make the actors do it for real. But I mean. I think that'd be kind of I also, cool like, don't have to pay for it, so it's easy for me to say <laughs> that. Um, and I'm not going to be held accountable if it doesn't turn out well, so. I uh, have enough confidence in these actors that it will turn out well. Well, um, we shall see if we ever do get that pipe show. Don't screw it up. And, and even though it is frustrating and saddening that we haven't had any type of official announcement on that after all this time, do not fret, because there's still a lot of Star Trek uh, coming down the... Coming down the Pike? Pike? <laughs> I'm sorry. That was not intentional. I did not mean to do that. Uh, but uh, That was your number one mistake. Yes, yeah, so um, be sure to check us out in about a month when we will return to discuss the new animated short treks we're getting. We're getting two in December. Um, there's actually... Star Trek a- is for babies now, too. <laughs> well, it's done animation before. Yeah, yeah. And she'll do it again. Um, we, there's a brief little teaser for these, uh, one short, uh, I guess it's the one Ephraim and Dot appears to be about a, uh, tardigrade from Discovery meeting one of the repair robots that I hate from yep. the Enterprise. Yep. Um, and there's also one that we don't know much about called The Girl Who Made the Stars about a girl yes. uh, who I guess will make stars. That one looked cg and the other yeah. one looked like it was traditional animation well, or I, maybe cell shaded. Yeah, I think it was cell shaded CG. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm very curious to check those out. I don't have really any idea uh, what those will be like, so I'm kind of excited to see them. And uh, that those will be dropping on December 12th. We should have our podcast out talking about those mm-hmm. three days later on Sunday, December 15th. Yep. And then and then we'll be back in uh, 2020. We're talking about the final uh, short track of. Uh, season two of Short Treks, Children of Mars, which will be a Picard uh, prelude. Then we will be, t- of course, talking about Star Trek Picard, which is going to be uh, what we're currently being told is a 10-episode season. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, Disco Season 2 is going to be out next year. We're also getting the Lower Decks animated show. So there is plenty of us to talk about. Uh, so much stuff. Yeah. So uh, still, still feels weird that we... Uh, yeah. Uh, um, when we're right in the thick of it and there's like, I, I don't know when we're going to have like the most things going on, I guess, will there be overlap between Picard and Disco Season 2? No. I mean, they haven't said when Disco Season 2 is coming out, but I, the, they, they have said in the past, like the plan is to have like a new episode of Star Trek every week. I, there, 
they don't they don't have enough shows to uh okay i wasn't sure how if we were quite ready to start getting into a cw territory where you have like six super shows they superhero shows in a week they won't do that they don't have they're like first of all like they don't do like 22 episode seasons yeah um it's 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 almost certainly like, for the best. Like those, but it would those be shows kind of, have such large seasons that they have to overlap. It would be kind of cool to have two Star Trek episodes of different shows in the same week. I mean, that's how I grew up. Yeah, I know. I, I'm trying to return you to your childhood, Father. I, I grew up with like episodes of DS9, and episodes of Voyager every week. Yeah, and I got I got 52 episodes of Star Trek a year, and every two years I got a TNG movie. And well, you were spoiled, but I was spoiled. Uh, I thought it would just be like that for the rest of. I've, I've talked about this before. Like it never occurred to me that at one point they would just cancel Star Trek and we would go years without any new Star Trek. That never occurred to me. And yet, your sheer willpower and your your sadness over losing it has managed to alter and warp reality to the point where it's close. It's close more. It's getting closer and closer to that uh, every day. Yeah. Who knows what it's going to be like in five years. I don't know if if my if I if I had the willpower to like reshape reality, I think reality would 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 look a little different than how it currently looks. Well, um, but it, I guess having Star Trek does make it uh, more bearable as we approach uh, <laughs> World War Three and uh, almost uh, certain demise that maybe we can rise from the ashes like the Phoenix and make first contact with the Vulcans. Way to send us out on a gloomy note, Father. Yeah, sorry, but uh, we, 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 once he's seen Ephraim and Dot, his heart will grow three sizes, and everything will be just okay like the again. Grinch. It'll be a Christmas miracle in December, just in time for Christmas. Nice, we'll hope for so, it. Yeah. So uh, again, we can check out our thoughts on Ephraim and Dot and the girl who made the stars on December fifteenth. But until then, as always, live, live long, long and, and prosper, prosper, y'all. Thank all of you so much for checking out this installment of Text Trek. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please be sure to like our YouTube videos and subscribe to our channel. Uh, Audio-only version of episodes are available at our website, www.text-trek.com. Uh, please check out our site, especially if you just want an audio-only podcast. Uh, we have that available for you. Y'all can also keep up with us online. You can follow us on Twitter, at TX Trek, or you can uh, check us out on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash text-trek. Uh, please, by all means, let us know what you think by dropping a comment anywhere you see fit. Uh, we definitely want to hear your feedback. Let us know what you liked and what you would like to see more of, what you would like to see differently going forward. If you want to email me directly, uh, go ahead. I can be reached at fatheryactual at text-trek.com. Thank all y'all again. Take care.